Welcome to Relax Your Grid. I'm your host, Matt Brown. In this episode, I speak with Clawhammer banjo player Adam Hurt. Adam is best known for his Gord banjo album, Earth Tones, but he's had a number of releases over the years, and we speak about several of them, including his collaborations with a variety of other artists. He's also a world-renowned instructor, and if you're out there and eager to play the banjo in the Clawhammer style, consider getting on Adam's waitlist. It will be well worth that wait. Adam Hurt, welcome to Relax Your Grid. Thank you, Matt Brown. Great to be here with you. I haven't seen you in quite a while. I I think the very last time was in Chicago at the Warbler. This is one of my favorite restaurants right across from the Old Town School of Folk Music. Does that seem right to you? That's right. As far as I recall, too, that was in late 2018. Oh, my goodness. And you were there with Megan Lynch Chowning. You had conducted maybe a day of workshops at the Old Town School and then were celebrating with a delicious dinner. Does that also... That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah, we were on a mini Midwestern tour and Chicago was sort of our turnaround point. And it was great to celebrate that milestone with you at the Warbler. Yeah, yeah. I I was listening to that record this morning with my son, Benton, and I was struck by a, a number of things. It's it's a really nice duet, although there is guitar. Who Who's the guitar player on your Inside Out album with Megan? Megan's husband, Adam Chowning, she has all of these Adams in her life, she jokes about, uh, played six-string guitar, and Tyler Andall played four-string tenor guitar. Awesome. Okay, because there is that, there are those moments where it sounds a little bit more like the, the contest-style accompaniment, and that would probably be Tyler, um, who knows that so well. Right. I think of it as a duo album with really strong guitar accompaniment. And it was interesting to listen to that record because it was a reminder of your your skill in collaborating with other musicians, as well as your ability to be like this very clear voiced banjo presence where like every single note is delivered with precision and attention and care. What what led you and Megan to make that that record together. Well, and thank you for your kind words on that project too, and my con- contributions to it. I've listened to Texas style fiddling uh, sort of as a pastime for many, many years and really enjoyed it and learned a lot from it. I do not play that style myself on the fiddle. I really admire the technical abilities that it requires. And I think a lot of modern Texas style playing can be kind of overdone, but the pioneers of that style, like Eck Robertson, if we go way back, and Benny Thomason, a little bit more recently, to me were old-time fiddlers with just a very different take on the repertoire and the rhythm and uh, just the whole aesthetic. So it doesn't seem that foreign to me, really, compared to other sort of progressive old-time fiddlers like Ed Haley and Doc Roberts and Clark Kessinger and people like that. So I love that stuff before I got to know Megan through the banjo camps that she and her husband host at their home in Nashville. And then they started hiring me to teach at those camps. And I was like, oh, I know what kind of fiddle music you specialize in. But I didn't really want to talk about it because I felt like I was such an interloper in that world and kind of clueless about it other than having listened to it a lot at home. I didn't know any other Texas-style players. I had never jammed with a Texas-style player. Clawhammer banjo certainly doesn't fit into Texas-style fiddle music, does it? But... We sort of got to talking about our shared interests, hers much more hands-on than mine, in Texas-style fiddle, and thought, you know, why can't these two instruments playing these two different ways get along? And uh, we just started jamming on some repertoire from the Texas-style canon that she had always played and that I had listened to enough to have a sense of how the banjo could maybe fit into it. And the project just grew out of that experience, which was very random and very lighthearted and very fun. She tells everyone, she would say it better than I can reproduce here, that uh, we were trying to create a genre of music in that project that people didn't know they wanted. <laughs> I like it. 
that's been on my mind because yesterday um, prior to taping this I also listened straight through Earth Tones your first Gord Banjo album and then I had this idea when when you and I agreed to to record this interview I had this idea to listen to Back to the Earth your follow-up Gord Banjo album immediately after like in one sitting just to go Gord Banjo Gord Banjo and see see what the trajectory was so yesterday I did the Gord Banjo Plunge, um, and, and I want to talk to you about both of those projects. And then this morning we listened to Inside Out, where you're not on a Gord Banjo. And one thing I noticed that I really am curious about, because I've never asked you about this before, is a question of tempo. A lot of Texas fiddling that I've seen and heard, whether at a contest itself or just in a jam, they don't tend to play very fast. I always think of it like in Irish music, like you don't play a hornpipe very fast because the dancer has a lot of intricacy that they need to deliver with precision. And so Texas fid- fiddling, they don't tend to play crazy fast because they have a lot of variations and things that they want to fit in. And I've noticed about you in the 20 some years that we've known each other since meeting at Clifftop that I rarely hear you play really, really fast. And instead, you tend to pick these very gentle tempos and then you deliver at like this astonishing level of accuracy. Where does that come from? And when did you decide that for performance or for recording, it's okay to like not play at square dance speed, not play at maybe a, a crazy late night jam speed, but like find this tempo where you can get all the all this tone and all these all the nuance that maybe is just too too hard to achieve up to speed, uh, up to dance speed. Well, you've hit on a lot of my thinking on this subject right there. So I'll basically agree with you, but go over the the process that is in my mind, too. A lot of what I like to do on the banjo is just that much harder to execute at a square dance tempo. And it doesn't even sound that good at a square dance tempo. At that sort of tempo, I'm going to want to leave out more details rather than cram them all in and have it all just sound like stream of consciousness eighth notes without the articulation necessary to really make music with all of those eighth notes. So that's part of it for me. I really am interested in tone production. I teach workshops on pulling the best tone you can from however your banjo is configured. That's really interesting to me, and I think it's something that a lot of clawhammer banjo players specifically just don't think about. They muck about with their setup, or they get different banjos, or whatever, and they're still not focused on the relationship between body and instrument, which is the biggest contributor to tone production in my estimation. And I'm just able to pull so much more tone of the sort that I like at more relaxed tempos. I think there is kind of an epidemic in old time music, and I don't know if it's following bluegrass music or what, but it's a contemporary thing of everything being played just a little bit too fast. And it's interesting to hear you reference dancers from the sort of hornpipe world. I hear a lot of people saying, well, it has to be fast enough for the dancers to do their thing. And I say, well, the dancers can't keep up if it's too fast either. We've got to strike a balance in there somewhere. I used to flat foot a lot. And in that world, I learned that there's a range of tempos that works. So I skew toward the slower end of that range, but I'm always trying to establish a groove. I'm trying to establish 
a rhythmic sort of core for the music that keeps it feeling slow, that keeps it feeling draggy. And that's what I hear in a lot of the recordings of the great old players. Sure, there are occasional tempos that are just blazing fast. Occasional. But there are a whole lot more that are very moderate. Very moderate. And yet, they have this incredible feeling of drive. And I think a lot of modern listeners are mistaking that drive, that groove, that rhythmic core for speed. And it's just not the same thing. And I think that if these tunes, with all of their detail, are played too fast, they really begin to sound like the stereotype of old-time music. All of these tunes just sound the same. Didn't you just play that one? When it's the details and the differences that I want to highlight and that I think are interesting. So more relaxed tempos enable me to do more of that, I think. Was there a point early on when you were playing faster and then you decided to rein in? Or do you think you've always, from the start, liked the the slower tempos that you've described? I've rarely aimed to play very fast. Occasionally I have, and then other times it's just happened. It's funny, though, to listen back to some of my earlier recorded projects and hear just how fast those tempos are, and faster than I even remembered them. I can remember those recording sessions, I can remember the material on those projects, and if I were to try and play them today like I remembered them, or like I thought I remembered them, they'd come out in my current typical tempo range when, unfortunately, much to my chagrin, those recordings were actually quite a bit faster than I would prefer them to be today. So I guess it's been an evolution to a certain extent, but like I say, playing blazing fast has never been a priority for me. I just did a quick scan because this is how my brain works of your al- your album insight and in listening to like 3 seconds of five tunes across that album while you while you spoke i would guess if you re-recorded all of that repertoire now you'd you'd probably be 20 beats per minute slower i could believe that like on popular bluff and i mean it's great repertoire and your arrangements are great and i don't hear any missed notes or anything but like popular bluff garfield's blackberry blossom some of these tunes like the breakdowns they're and, and like some of the round peak repertoire, Sally Ann, June Apple. I feel like Adam of 2021 might play those tunes a little slower for, for all those reasons you discussed. And yet when that album came out and I heard it, I don't think I ever thought, oh, he's really slamming through these tunes. Like there still is, there's drive more than speed. Thank you. of this podcast the podcast is called relax your grid and i've talked to a number of the guests about this idea of a grid with music in terms of like how how rigidly to hold to you know precision in rhythm or how how important micro ten, micro tonality is for folk traditions um and and this concept of drive is one that i think is a fascinating one and and deserves a lot of attention because like you said, it's different than the actual tempo. So there's a way of playing at 100 beats per minute that has a driving quality, maybe more powerful than playing sloppily at 120. Um, do you, so you've, you've made a couple solo albums or, or you'll have tracks where it's just you, but you've also had great collaborations with uh, our friend Stephanie Coleman and with Beth Williams Hartness and Megan and Adam um, and all these all these folks, when you get into the studio and you're trying to deliver these arrangements, do you get specific with folks about like how how you want the drive to be or like do you get is it an ex- explicit conversation or does it just tend to happen organically? 
It tends to happen with these players whose whole aesthetic I like so much and like enough to want to invite them to participate in my projects. I know that these people are going to accent the the kinds of beats that I like to accent and accent them in the way that I like, and they're going to keep the tempos from getting out of control. So it's mostly unspoken, but, um, you know, every now and then, if I detect a rushing quality, somebody playing a little bit more on the leading edge of the beat than I might like, sort of squarely over the center of the beat. We might have a couple words about that, <laughs> and then they'll dial back, and it'll be fine, and we'll reestablish that groove. Yeah, I love it. I, I'd i like to talk specifically about your banjo approach, because I, I talk about your banjo playing to my banjo students, my claw hammer students, and rarely do I get to interrogate you about your banjo playing. <laughs> so if you don't mind, there there are enough people who listen to this podcast who are banjo players themselves that I don't think they'll mind. May I ask you some specific questions about your style itself? Please, I'm honored. The arrangement of yours that I've taught the most is from Earth Tones, your, your first Gord, Gord banjo album. Um, the very end of the album, there's this medley of John Riley the Shepherd and Brushy Fork of Johns Creek. And the number of students who have worked with me on Round Peak Clawhammer Banjo, and then their reward is that they get to work on Adam's arrangement of those two tunes, um, is growing every every year. There are more people who've who've reached that Everest of of Clawhammer Banjo with me, where it's okay, you can play these this number of Round Peak tunes the way that Matt wants. Now you get to try an Adam Hurt arrangement. What I tell all those people who are eager to play like Adam Hurt, at least to, to understand where you're coming from, because it's so cool. I tell all of them that your style wouldn't be what it is without a really clear understanding of the round peak and related banjo styles. Would you agree with that? Yes. Thank you. And so I would love for you to tell the listener, maybe at kind of the elevator pitch level, but then also the banjo nerd level. What do you think distinguishes Round Peak Banjo? Okay. First of all, let me tell you how flattered I am that you teach my music to your students and that you think it's, you know, worth teaching. That really, really means a lot. And I don't think I've ever had this particular conversation with anyone else, whether another musician or another teacher who analyzes the details of the arrangements the way that you would, or anybody about the connection between round peak banjo and my arrangements of tunes that come from completely different traditions. So thank you for going there. Thank you for recognizing that there are common threads here. Okay, elevator pitch. That could be hard. Let's figure that the building is 50 stories tall or something, and then there will be some overlap with the, uh, the intense banjo geek level. Round Peak Banjo, to me, is sort of a composite of the ideas expressed by Tommy Jarrell, Kyle Creed, and Fred Cockerham. 
on the banjo. They all played great fiddle as well, but I'm focused on banjo here. Now, they all played in different ways, but it's the commonalities among those three players that make up what I think most of us today mean when we talk about round peak banjo. And that is a relative absence of brush strokes, multi-string strumming. Um, it's not that every space is filled with melody. No, there's still a lot of space in the music, but that space tends to be filled in with open individual strings, sort of treated as secondary drones to the fifth string, where other claw hammer players might brush a bunch of open strings or fret a complete chord, maybe. Partial slides all over the place are a real hallmark of this style, and maybe partial slides is a weird way to describe it, but I think of these slides as not connecting steps on the scale necessarily, but going from a pitch on the major scale to a blue note between it and the next pitch on that major scale, or sometimes starting on the blue note and then sliding into the major scale pitch. And to me, these are carryovers from the use of fretless banjos. And even though Tommy and Kyle recorded a certain amount of their work, Kyle especially, on the fretted banjo, they're doing all of these funny slides in ways that I think purely fretted banjo players never would have thought to do. Uh, so, lack of brushes, abundance of short slides, lots of uh, use of the Galax lick, the so-called Galax lick, which is a little bit of a misnomer because the Galax banjo style is quite a different thing from the round peak banjo style, but that's the way that the term uh, went into the lexicon thanks to some early banjo instructional book authors, I believe. The Galax lick is kind of a, a raking motion done by the striking finger across at least strings two and one, and then resolving to string five on a beat on a numbered beat. In the in Brad Leftwich's book, Round Peak Style Clawhammer Banjo, he refers to that same technique as a roll. A roll, I like that a whole lot because it really has that sound. It's an arpeggiated sound. And usually the fifth string is the highest pitch in the maneuver, not always, but usually. So we're climbing up to that pitch and focusing on that pitch in a way that we rarely do in claw hammer. I mean, so often that fifth string is just the heartbeat of the style and kind of an afterthought, not a focal point in the tune. But the Galax lick or the roll uh, puts all of the emphasis on that string and that pitch. I guess I would say that those three things, for me, are really the hallmarks. I've got a fourth. I agree with all of that. The fourth is the alternate string pull-off. Oh, of course, of course. Because that's one of the things that I hear you do so, like, like you were saying, not just with music from this part of North Carolina, but you'll do it in Kentucky, you know, with a tune from Kentucky, a tune from West Virginia, but pulling off usually often the first string, but not always, uh, especially in that medley I mentioned, um, doing a pull off of a string that hasn't just been struck with the right hand, with a, with a, the striking hand. That seems like the other piece of the puzzle that, of, of techniques that you gathered and and have taken throughout the repertoire. Of course, yes, thank you for that. All right, we've bypassed elevator pitch stage. We're in full-blown banjo geek stage. So, um, lack of brushes, short slides, Galax lick rolls, and absolutely alternate string pull-offs. And the alternate string pull-off showed up in the early approaches to so-called melodic claw hammer banjo. And I think I first became aware of it in that context before I really got into studying round peak banjo, but then lo and behold, here it is all over the place among the round peakers. I believe they always did this move on the first string. I may be wrong, but the melodic players do the move on strings one, two, and three, usually open, sometimes fretted. Round peakers, I think, were just on string one and open, but it's the same maneuver, and it can be used in a lot of really cool ways. The melodic players tend to use it for making more melody. It creates a strong sounding ascent 
where usually the ascent is a lot weaker than the descent because it's going to be a hammer on or a slide, not typically a drop thumb, unless you're doing some kind of crossover, which I hate and never do, or unless you're lucky and a fretted note that's accessible via drop thumb gives us that ascending line. Um, and a normal pull-off is always for a descending line, but it's a good strong sound. So this is a way of achieving strength in that other direction of movement that's otherwise kind of hard to do. And the round peakers did that to a very limited extent, again, on the first string, but they used it a whole lot more in what I think is a more interesting way, as something that I teach as a rhythmic space filler. Rhythmic space filler. And this too is often used in place of brushes, where more generic claw hammer banjo players might do a quarter note, brush five, quarter note, brush five. Tommy Jarrell might have done four eighth notes, striking an interior string plucking that first string with the fretting hand, coming back to the initial interior string. So we're hearing that twice in succession, and then fifth string. And the unit works very much the same way as that quarter brush five, quarter brush five thing, but the texture is so much more interesting. And since that interior string remains the focal point of the move, it doesn't really sound like four eighth notes of melody. It still creates a sense of space, even though the density is greater than a typical brush stroke filler would have been. Yeah, that is so true. And I think one of the things that's interesting about those clusters, those units of four eighth notes that you're talking about is someone could conceivably with, with four eighth notes, you can treat them all equally in terms of volume, or you can start playing games with, oh, the first and third in the in this set are my interior string melody notes, so those are louder. Or it's like, oh, I'm going to play around with it. The second and fourth are going to be a little louder this time. Or because I am trying to match a fiddle note that's the same pitch as my open fifth string, um, I'm going to introduce the fifth string as as the third in the four. Like they're, Whereas if you're doing the typical generic claw hammer riff that we all know and learn early on of melody note as a quarter brush and then five melody brush five you don't have as much to work with and, and a brush doesn't give you that chance um it gives you a different chance with a brush you get to articulate a chord sound if you choose right um but you can't play with all these small units um, of either melody or secondary drones or the drone on the fifth. Yeah. It's, there are more tools in the toolbox this way. Exactly. Exactly. The sort of dynamic possibilities of that type of lick um, are so appealing to me and um, take my arrangements to, I don't know, a different level of textural subtlety than I would be able to achieve without that alternate string pull-off used in that context. And I never would have dreamed of using it in that way, a non-melody making way, had I not gotten so deep into the round peak players. And I think a great example, even though the round peak players didn't play on gourd banjos a lot that I know of, Earth Tones, this gourd banjo album I've mentioned a couple times that Adam made that has really struck a nerve. Like people really love this album. People who don't necessarily love banjo music, I've heard you say, like really are drawn to this album even. You play Fortune on there in a very round peak way. And you can really hear all these articulations and and it's a you know, it's sparse but not empty because there aren't as many brushes. Um, and it's a lot of single notes in quick succession delivered uh flawlessly. Thank you, <laughs> I have, have to say. But it's like it's with a lot of like emotion and, and a lot of like expression. It's not, you know, it's it, it's not devoid of anything.
that fortune rendition in particular, I feel like is a nice reminder. And, and I think you including fortune on earth tones was one of my signals that like, oh, it really is the round peak toolbox that's allowing Adam to play these Kentucky tunes or, or these others as well, or, or these, you know, in the al- album with Megan that we talked about first. Um, I don't know that you would play. I don't know how you would have played those Texas tunes without some of those tools at your disposal. That's exactly right. Uh, getting to know the Round Peak style years ago, I'm still getting to know it in different ways, has really shaped my overall style. I mean, I don't consider myself a Round Peak player. I'm a banjo player. I'm a claw hammer banjo player. We don't need tighter labels than that, really, I don't think. But people ask me why I think my melodic claw hammer approach sounds different from, say, Ken Perlman's melodic approach or Howie Burson's melodic approach or other players of that ilk. And they're great players who have figured out really clever things of matching the fiddle melody's contours. But to my knowledge, they didn't study specific Southern claw hammer styles, round peak or otherwise. They learned how the claw hammer hand worked and then moved straight into the kind of repertoire and arrangements they wanted to play with the tools that they had available to them. But I think the round peak toolkit is like a a separate but parallel toolkit to the standard claw hammer toolkit. It's this whole different set of moves that can create a very different style and sound, but can complement the moves and the style and the sound of the conventional claw hammer toolkit in a way that really works for me, but that I haven't heard too many other players exploring. It's like people play round peak repertoire in a round peak sort of way, or they play other repertoire in these other ways. And I'm not sure that it has to be kept that separate. Yeah, I agree. I I start all my Clawhammer students with Brad Leftwich's aforementioned book because I think it's it's a nice way. There's some nice biographical information. There's a map of the region great arrangements, little stories and the, and the song lyrics all packaged into one affordable <laughs> banjo book. It's the only banjo book I teach out of. Um, and we don't stay there, but that's where we start. And I tell all these students that I'm not trying to make any of them into round peak banjo players. I just want them to know some of this repertoire, which is great banjo music, and to have this toolbox that you and I are describing. Thank you. You're doing a great service to your banjo community. Well, I appreciate it. And I appreciate that you keep sending students my way as well. So happy to do it. And, you know, to listeners out there who aren't already taking banjo lessons from you or from me or anyone else who loves to teach round peak banjo, that Brad Leftwich book is a must have for any serious student of claw hammer banjo. And I think it does an amazingly comprehensive job for the kind of resource that it is in teaching the aesthetic of this special style. Yeah, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. So if anyone wants to get a copy, you can. Great. Now, going back to the Adam Hurt style of banjo, we talked about the round peak element of your toolbox, but you're a person in your 30s from Minnesota, and round peak is not the entirety of what you do on the banjo. You're also adept at using a variety of tunings that aren't the standard G tuning, double C tuning. How how do you think about when you're programming a piece for yourself? How do you go about deciding, oh, this is going to work in this tuning? Is it is it a matter of looking for as many melody notes that are going to be on open strings rather than fretted, even though I know you're very adept at finding the frets up and down the neck? Where <laughs> how do you, what's your process for that? Well, I do love the sound of a good open string. So that's part of the process, but I don't know that that's like the guiding force behind my choice of a certain tuning for a certain tune. If I'm planning to arrange this to play with a fiddler, I try to not change the key of the piece out of deference to the fiddler. 
Occasionally I've done that when I know that the key change I'm making is something that the fiddler can deal with. I play the fiddle as well, so I have a reasonable sense of what will and won't work well on that instrument and sound good on that instrument. But if I'm working on a piece with sort of solo banjo performance or recording or whatever in mind, or a banjo-led ensemble performance or recording in mind, then I throw the key out the window and I focus on uh, the range of the melody. Where's the high point? Where's the low point? And uh, which tuning's range best corresponds to those points? I often find that the double D or double C tuning is a better match for the range of tunes that fiddlers play in A than is the open A tuning on the banjo. And a lot of those tunes are not going to sound good or play well at all on the fiddle in D, and heaven forbid playing them in C, but if that's not my point, um, I can often maintain the original contours of the fiddle melody better in the double D style tuning, which has sort of two octaves right there at my disposal without having to go way up into the stratosphere. And that way I'm not having to jump octaves from phrase to phrase the way I would have to do in the open A tuning if I wanted to play all of the notes in the correct key. And that's going to sound pretty strange without a fiddler playing alongside me and maintaining the correct shape of the tune. So that's a lot of it for me. Um, to the extent that I want to state or suggest chords, and if I'm playing in a more round peak influenced way, it's more about suggesting them than stating them, certain chord voicings in certain tunings are going to be more my cup of tea for a particular tune than the chord voicings correspondingly in uh, other tunings. So I guess it would be those three things in the order of tune range, chord voicings, and open strings that I'd be thinking about. That makes a lot of sense because as a fiddle player, you know that many of the A tunes, the tunes on the fiddle that that sound great in the key of A and are usually played in the key of A, there's a large group of those that are played in cross A tuning where the lowest note is an A. Well, the double D tuning, double C tuning, the lowest note, the fourth string note is the root, it's D. And so if you're trying to express the full range and not jump octaves in a weird way, of course it makes sense to not play in A tuning, but instead play in a tuning where the root is the lowest note, just like it is in a lot of those fiddle arrangements. I'd never thought of that. That's brilliant. Thank you. I appreciate it. It has created some problems. Uh, I run into fiddlers from time to time at festivals, when they're happening anyway, who come up to me raving about this great tune that they learned off of one of my recording projects, and they can't wait to play it with me. And, okay, we sit down to play, and I'm figuring we're going to play it in the Fiddler's standard key, but no, they're deferring to my key, and that makes it nice for me, because I can just play it the way that I usually play it. But then they go around sharing the tunes with their crowds in the quote-unquote incorrect key. <laughs> <laughs> so apologies to fiddlers out there who have been made to learn tunes that I've spread in the quote-unquote incorrect key. You can feel free to transpose them into the quote-unquote correct key and just ask your banjo players to tune accordingly. This is the first blanket apology that's ever been issued on this podcast, and I love it. <laughs> it might not be the last in this very episode. We'll see. So talking about your recordings once more, I do want to return to your newest release, Back to the Earth. And it features, as I mentioned, some more of your solo gourd banjo music, which which we know and love, but some really exciting collaborations where you got to take the gourd banjo into a room with other people. And those other people include 
Brittany Haas, Paul Cohort, and Jordan Tice from formerly from Haas Cohort Tice, now from the larger band Hocktail, um, and some others. And I, I'd like to talk to you just a little bit about those collaborations, knowing that you've also spoken on the Picky Fingers podcast about that album in length. So people should listen to your episode to get the full rundown. Thank you. I remember getting a text from my friend Tim Riddell, who was, I think, in the front row at the station in the night that you joined Hawktail um, to play a bunch of your repertoire that they had learned. And that that collaboration live led to you recording with them later. Um, what was it like to take the gourd banjo and and figure out these arrangements with these very sensitive musicians where the banjo is still front and center, but there are all these lovely textures around and underneath. Well, it was just an unbelievable experience, both back in 2017 at the Station Inn, and then more recently when we were working up the couple of collaborations as a quartet for the recording project. I had known Brittany, Jordan, and Paul for a few years, sort of peripherally, and couldn't have been more humbled when they reached out to me to tell me that they had this monthly residency at the Station Inn. They like to bring in a different guest to join them every time, and they'd love to bring me in to play Earth Tones repertoire. And I was thinking, how do I belong in this collection of musicians, for one thing? And for another thing, how is this going to work? I had played the gourd banjo very limitedly with other musicians before then. Very limitedly, like with one other musician or with two other musicians, and that was it. And generally not on material that I had recorded on earth tones. I sort of thought of that for no particular reason as solo repertoire, and if I was trying to combine gourd banjo with other sounds, that was a different repertoire for no particular reason. That's just where I was. But I thought, well, if anybody can figure out a nice way to make a band sound work with gourd banjo in the sort of lead, it's going to be those three players. They have unbelievable taste. They have unbelievable abilities on their instruments. It's going to work. I'm just going to be totally nervous and, again, wondering why am I here? But they couldn't have been nicer, so I accepted their invitation uh, with much gratitude. We had a day of rehearsal. They had learned all the stuff from Earth Tones. It was hilarious. And they like knew not just the basic repertoire, but my variations, my arrangements, inside and out, better than I knew them at that time, seven years after I had recorded Earth Tones. And the gig was kind of magical. And the sound of that quartet just stuck with me. I wasn't even thinking at that point of making another gourd banjo album, but as my mind sort of shifted in that direction, I thought, well, how can I make this not sound just like another earth tone, solo gourd banjo with a different collection of tunes? And I thought, well, why not collaborate with some of my favorite musicians and why not start with Brittany, Paul, and Jordan? Because they have such a special sound and they just brought that old music to life for me in completely new ways. So I reached out and floated the, the idea and I couldn't have been happier when they agreed to participate. At what point in the process of making the new album did Dave Cinco enter the picture as, as an engineer? 
Paul and I had worked together on a film score some years prior that Dave engineered. That's where I first got to know Dave, and the gourd banjo was part of that project. He loved the gourd banjo. And so when I thought, well, I want to make a new album with the gourd banjo, and I want to be very serious about it this time, and hire the best people and the best facilities that I can afford and that I have access to, he was my first call engineer. And I didn't expect him to have room in his schedule. I didn't expect him to have interest in this project. He responded immediately, and he was so excited. And that made me so happy. Is the film the one Angel's Perch? That's right. And was Chris Eldridge involved in that as well? Yeah, Chris did the score for that film. It was set in Pocahontas County, West Virginia, and so the filmmaker wanted the soundtrack to have sort of a regionally appropriate sound. And Chris Critter, some listeners may know him better as, wrote some new music in kind of an Appalachian-informed style, and then had us play some traditional Southern music as well. But he asked me to play banjo in the band. And some of it was gourd banjo and some of it was was steel strung banjo. Was there any music from Pocahontas County like the Hammonds family represented in that film? You know, there sure should have been, right? But I'm trying to remember whether there was. John Riley the Shepherd made an appearance on the gourd banjo, but that's Kentucky. Glory in the Meeting House made an appearance. That's also Kentucky. Wouldn't it be something if there was no West Virginia music on that project? There may not have been. I haven't seen the film for a few years. I need to go back and watch again and listen. More of the music was contemporary stuff from Critter's mind. Um, But I feel like there must have been something from the Hammonds family in there, don't you think? (laughs) Yeah. The one time I've performed in Pocahontas County, uh, I, I did get to play Ed and Hammond's tune at the Opera House. At wow. Marlinton, West Virginia, I think might be. That's right. The, the mm-hmm. county seat. And uh, that was really special to just know that the Hammond's family, like, this is where they were. And and to get to play some of that music there. Yeah. I know when, when Greg Reich and I decided to make our duo record, the only the person at the top of our list to engineer it was also Dave Cinco. And Dave and I had visited socially, but I'd never worked together. And when I reached out to him, I remember he was very responsive. Like, I think I got in touch with him right away. And he didn't say yes right away, but he started asking questions immediately about like, well, what are you envisioning? Like, what kind of space? What kind of microphone? And it very quickly turned into a yes, which I was I had the same I was coming from the same place that you described where I didn't really expect him to say yes. I didn't expect him to have time. I didn't expect to be able to afford him. Um, I wasn't sure what his interest was in old time music because I knew of him working with these very progressive figures in modern bluegrass and beyond. Exactly. And yet he's the nicest guy in the world and loves acoustic music and is so generous. And it was very clear that he was curious about what we were hoping to achieve and our, our vision for it. So you also on this same record got to collaborate with Ricky Skaggs. Yes. And I find I found it so interesting that Skaggs is on the record because I heard through the grapevine that he also is a huge fan of your Earth Tones album. And so I wanted to force you on microphone to just tell us how did you and Ricky get to know each other? It was so random. Uh, My friend Russ Carson has been the banjo player in Kentucky Thunder for several years now. Russ also plays great claw hammer banjo, but not a lot of people know that. And he was heavily influenced by one of my banjo heroes, Reed Martin, good friend of his for a long, long time, as well as by his own father, Glenn Carson, who's an old-time fiddler and banjo player. Russ and his parents went to Clifftop in some of those early years that you and I were going to Clifftop, too. So we sort of grew up in the same festival milieu there, even though Russ was often kind of in the background playing some rhythm guitar, not really playing a whole lot of banjo in either style. But we got acquainted there, 
And when he got the gig with Ricky, he told me that he had shared earth tones with Ricky and that it was like being played in the tour bus, which cracked me up. And then this was a few years ago. I got a, a private message on Facebook from Ricky introducing himself, which was also hilarious because I've been a big fan of his music for a long, long time. And wanting to know more about that gourd banjo and wanting to know where he might be able to get one. So I tried to help him find a suitable gourd banjo. It ended up not quite working out for him, but he remained very interested in fretless gourd banjo and um, in my approach to the kinds of old-time fiddle tunes that he grew up listening to and learning as a child in eastern Kentucky. It turns out that we have many very similar early musical influences, and I can hear a lot of that influence in even his newest bluegrass music, which I don't hear in a lot of contemporary bluegrass musicians' work, for better or for worse. But we sort of struck up a correspondence after that gourd banjo interest was piqued, and we finally met, thanks to Russ again, backstage at the Tennessee Valley Fiddlers Convention in northern Alabama. That was in the fall of 2018. I had been hired to judge contests there, and after the contests were over, Kentucky Thunder played a set on the same stage where the contests were held, and the judges had front row seats for this, like, 10,000 spectator event. It was amazing. So there I was looking up at Kentucky Thunder playing, and after they were done, Russ gave me the sign to just follow them off stage and visit a little bit. So I did, and Ricky couldn't have been kinder or more humble, and just wasn't at all what I expected for someone of his stature in the music. And he basically said, look, if you ever want to record with this instrument again and you could use something I do, let me know. That is so cool. Right. Your jaw is dropping on Zoom. My jaw is still dropped. And uh, I took him at his word, and about a year after that, I reached out and I said, you know, I'm starting to plan for this project, and I'd love for you to play a tune on it with me on the mandolin. I have in mind a Kentucky tune from John Salyer that I thought he might connect with, and he said, sounds like a plan. Send me a recording to learn from, and I'll work it out, and we'll get together in the studio, which we then did. I had given him a preview of what I wanted to do with it on the gourd banjo, but he came up with his own thing, and he took so much time that day with me in the studio. Again, not what I would have expected. I figured it might have to be a quick in, quick out sort of thing, but no, we really massaged the arrangement together in real time, and I couldn't have been more thrilled with the experience start to finish. With your blessing, could we make the full track that we include in this episode, Kentucky Winder, your duet with Ricky? Certainly, I'd be delighted. All right, here it is. Thank you. 
Am I right that the person who introduced teenaged Adam to teenaged Matt was Marianne Kovach? That's my memory as well. Yes. What led to you coming to Clifftop? And and tell us a little little bit about Marianne. Sure. Well, uh, that was in 1999, my first time at Clifftop. My mother brought me to Clifftop that year. My father brought me to Clifftop the next two years from Minnesota. We made the thousand mile drive down and thousand mile drive back because I was really bitten by the old time music bug by that point in my teenage life. And I had been told by person after person from the Twin Cities old time music scene and beyond that Clifftop needed to be on my bucket list. So finally we made it happen and it was a life changing experience. And it has been every year thereafter. I've missed one year since that first experience at Clifftop. Uh, pandemic cancellations aside, and I just can't wait to get back there. I don't think I would ever take a gig during that week, and I would hope no other life event would get in the way. It feels like all of my most important personal connections and a lot of my sort of musical epiphanies can be traced back in some way to Clifftop, and I'm so grateful for it. But that was a very fortuitous encounter from my perspective because of the ways that our lives have continued to intersect all these years later. Marianne Kovach, who introduced us, was my first banjo teacher. She was living in Minneapolis at the time, although as of 99, she had moved to North Carolina for closer access to the music, and she's stayed in the South ever since, and I sort of (laughs) followed in her footsteps in many ways just a few years thereafter. But I guess, did she know you because of her Pennsylvania connections from way back? I don't remember. I don't remember how I knew Marianne Maybe it was meeting her just at Clifftop or, yeah, I can't recall. But but I, I can picture that day that she made a point that we would, that you and I would meet. Like it was, she had a, yeah. a goal that you and I would meet each other. Because at that time, as far as I recall, the only musicians our age who were playing old time music at Clifftop were you, me, and Stephanie Coleman. Exactly. There just weren't many of us, and that's changed for the better since then, but there really weren't back then. And at home in Minnesota, there wasn't anybody my age who played old-time music. There were some young people who played bluegrass, and I overlapped with them to a certain extent, but this was a brand new experience, and I was so excited to meet someone of like mind who was also an age group peer. So thank you for being so friendly and welcoming to me when Marianne made the introduction. You're welcome and, and thank you in return because I was desperate. Like I desperate's maybe the wrong word, but I was so eager to find people my age who played this music at that time. And as you know, now there, there are many, many folks, including the children of some of the people you and I were playing with at the time who then went on to pick up the instruments themselves and are very fine musicians now. In that era, in the late 90s, they were they wanted nothing to do with the music. They wanted to run around and just be only focus on being kids and having fun in the woods. Um, I kind of split my time at Clifftop between that and trying to play some fiddle tunes. And then it was such a delight to meet you and Stephanie those first couple of years and know that, oh, maybe Maybe it's not just my parents' age people who like this thing that I like, too. Right, right. I think it's wonderful that we get to interface with people of all ages and from various generations who come together out of shared love for this music. But we also want to know that all of the people we love to play music with aren't someday just going to disappear, age out. It's nice to know that there will be people our age and younger uh, coming in too. It's so true. Before we go, I just want to make take a, a minute speaking of the generations to come and, and just the, the sharing of the music across the generations. I want to take a minute to encourage folks to visit your website regularly to check out which camps you'll be teaching at, workshops, all that sort of thing. I've known, I know you've given some online workshops during the pandemic. 
If anyone's interested in taking banjo lessons with Adam, he has a wait list, which means you might not sign up for a lesson for next week. But if you get on that wait list, there's a chance you could become one of his students, regular students, before too long. So if you have any curiosity about it, do you do you take students of a certain certain parameter or is it just anyone who who fits your schedule and is available to slot in? Are there any limitations to who you work with? Honestly, I think the technology is really the only limitation. I teach mainly via Zoom, Skype, and related video conferencing platforms. Now, if you want to come to my home in Southern Virginia, we can work on that too. But I don't feel that brand new beginners are best served by online lessons, even if they're one-on-one -on -one and totally dynamic, because I love having the ability to reach over and manipulate hands and manipulate the instrument position. And unfortunately, I haven't figured out a way to reach through the computer screen to do that yet. But that said, I have worked from scratch with a few highly motivated brand new players who simply didn't have access to in-person instruction in their area and still wanted to learn. And they've done fine. It's just a little trickier and a little slower going than if they had had that jump start in person. But beyond that, I'm happy to work with all comers who are interested in my approach to the instrument and are interested in taking their playing and their arranging to a different level. Uh, happy to help. Please reach out. That's so great. Well, the last thing I want to want to plug for everyone is you've heard clips of Adam's music in this episode. You've heard an entire track and you'll hear a little bit more as we go out. If you really want to support him and show that you love what he's doing and encourage him to make the next record, go support him on Bandcamp. It's a way that you can pay money for the music and stream it and see who else is supporting him. Of course, you might find some of it elsewhere, Spotify and the others, but Bandcamp is really the best way to show someone, an independent artist like Adam, that you really appreciate what he's doing and encourage him to do it some more. Thank you for that. Bandcamp has been a wonderful thing for me. I just got on it uh, last summer, shortly before the new album came out, and it couldn't be better for the artist. And I think for the music listener and lover, too. I buy things on there myself all the time. I love the way the app works, and I'm not really that into apps. It's just a wonderful, wonderful platform for everyone. Awesome. Well, Adam, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. My Patreon supporters are in for a treat. You're going to show them on video uh, some of your antique banjos that you have lying around your beautiful home. So um, if you're a supporter, you can log on to Patreon and see that. And if you'd like to become one for even just two dollars a month, you have access to this show and tell Adam's about to give as well as Bruce Molsky playing a guitar piece and Greg Reich giving a barbecue recipe. All of that said, once again, Adam, thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. What a treat it has been. Relax Your Grid is produced, edited, and mixed by me, Matt Brown. Tim Brown provides post-production assistance. Otto Allard is my designer. Tune in next time for my interview with cellist Natalie Haas. And until then, relax your grid. <laughs>